Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. It is I, Phoenix. If you are new to the channel and you start to begin to love what you are hearing, we would love to have you as part of the family. You only have to hit that subscribe button and don't forget to set your notification bell to all. That way you'll be reminded of every time a video is uploaded. If you would like to learn how to become a subscriber to the channel, all that information can be found down below. Without further ado, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person every day. So, sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled, True Haunted Houses. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. We lived in Germany in the mid-90s. My dad was army and stationed there. We lived in this one house, an apartment and duplex. It's like a family unit on the first floor, another upstairs plus shared basement and attic. That was haunted. One night, my brother, probably eight years old at the time, wakes up the entire house screaming bloody murder. He says he saw a cloaked figure at the foot of his bed. The feeling he got from it was pure hate, like the thing did not want him there. Years later, as we were sitting around drinking, my dad admits he saw it too while he busted into my brother's room. My dad, a very hard-ass army officer and not prone to bullshit, says he's always been sensitive to these kinds of things. Another time, my other, then baby brother, is asleep in his crib at the end of the hall. Me and my other two siblings are watching TV in the living room. My parents are out, so it's just us kids. I would have been 10 or 11 at the time, I do believe. At the beginning of the hallway was my baby brother's little bear that said the Lord's Prayer if you pressed a button on the paw. Untouched, nowhere near any of us kids, that thing starts its prayer. I kick that thing into another room and slam the door. The attic was a no-go area. It just felt too off. Like you were being watched by something that hated you. Several times, my mom would hear noises coming from the kitchen, going in thinking my dad came home for lunch, only to find an empty kitchen. This was army housing, Occam housing in Beast Baden. Creepy place. I wished I could find another family that stayed there and compare stories. Hundreds of families would have lived there over the years. I'm sure of it. My husband and I moved into the house we currently live in a little over four years ago. We live on Long Island, New York in a very old colonial house built in 1907. Ever since moving in, we've experienced some very strange things. The first experience still freaks me out to this day. I left work early as I was sick with a cold. I went straight upstairs to our bedroom to take a nap. After lying in bed for a few short minutes, I heard the sound of someone coming up the stairs. Clear as day, footsteps on each step. Now, our staircase has two sets of stairs with a landing in between. So the entity made its way slowly up the first set of stairs, paused for a moment, then the second set. Our bedroom door sits at the top of the stairs. Whatever it was, it just stopped right at our door. I rationalized it as my husband coming home from work. But it didn't make sense as he wouldn't be due to come home for another hour and a half. And in my heart, I knew it wasn't him. I genuinely got just a scared feeling. My entire body stiffened up and all of my senses heightened. Later, when my husband did come home, I asked him if he came home early and then maybe 
went downstairs again and told him what I heard. He said that no, he just got home, but he didn't quite believe me. Well, about a month later, he experienced the same thing. He was home from work, alone, of course, and laid down to take a nap when he heard footsteps coming up the stairs. He then started believing we weren't alone in the house. We had our baby, a boy, in 2021, and one night I was up breastfeeding him. I used to go downstairs to our living room so my husband could sleep as we went back to our work after paternity leave. So I'm sitting on the big comfy armchair snuggling our newborn, who fell asleep in my arms, when I suddenly hear footsteps upstairs. Clear as day, footsteps in our upstairs hallway. I freeze and listen carefully knowing that I didn't hear our bedroom door open, so it could not have been my husband. Oddly enough, about 10 minutes later, my husband does get up to use the bathroom, and I call up to him and ask him if he was up before, to which he said no, he just got up, then to go to the bathroom. I was so creeped out, I refused to breastfeed downstairs anymore, and only did it in our bedroom from then on. The last big thing that happened was my mom, who lives out of state, was coming to visit and babysat for us to give us our first official date night since having our son. We got home after dinner, and my mom looked horrified. She said that she was sitting in the rocking chair with my son who was asleep in her arms, when suddenly she heard footsteps outside the bedroom door, and then three loud bangs against it like someone was banging their fists against it angrily. She said she jumped right up and opened the door to check, but no one was there. She anxiously awaited our arrival back and has been afraid to stay with us ever since. Since then, We've experienced little things here and there, but it seems the activity has died down. My son is older now and has told us that the walls in his room talk to him, which creeped us out, but we chalked it up to overactive toddler imagination. I'm honestly glad that nothing has really happened since then, as it sincerely freaks me out, and I don't want my son getting scared either. Oh yes, one more little edit to the story here. I also wanted to add one more thing that may or may not be related to what we have already experienced. One day a few months ago, we were eating dinner when my son, out of nowhere, tells us, I played with Grandpa yesterday. So we assumed he met my dad as my husband's father unfortunately passed away several years ago. When I asked him what he meant, because we haven't seen my dad in a while, he said, no, not that grandpa, my other grandpa. My husband and I looked at each other and asked him what this grandpa looked like. He said, he looks like a girl with long hair and he had wings and flew up into the sky. My husband's dad was a musician and had long hair all of his life. I shit you not, we were so freaked out, but also relieved. Like, maybe this ghost was his grandpa looking out for us? I'm not sure, but it was one of the craziest things to have happened to us. Hello everyone, my name is Matt, and I'm from the United Kingdom. Like many of us in this community, I've had my share of paranormal experiences, some stretching back to my childhood. However, in this story, I want to focus on a series of events that took place in my current home, a series that still leaves me questioning what truly happened. I live just outside of Birmingham on a council estate. For those unfamiliar, a council estate in the UK is somewhat akin to the projects in the USA, government-subsidized housing. 
The estate I live on isn't particularly odd. The houses were built in the 1940s or 50s. And from what I know, there haven't been many occupants before us. Our house is a modest two-bedroom with spacious front and back gardens. For the first two years, everything was completely normal. The house never had a menacing or intimidating feel to it, nor did I ever sense any unusual energy. It was just an ordinary home until the summer of 2020. Around July or August of that year, right in the midst of the COVID pandemic, things started to change. What followed over the next two to three months was a series of events that still gives me the chills when I think about them. Incident number one. The first incident might seem insignificant on its own, but it's worth mentioning as it marks the beginning of the strange occurrences in our home. It was late at night and my partner and I were in bed when we both heard a knocking noise. At first, it seemed like it was coming from outside, but the strangest part was that it sounded like it was coming from the other side of our bedroom wall. Now, here's the thing. There's nothing on the other side of that wall. If someone or something had been knocking where we thought the sound was coming from, they would have had to be suspended about 20 feet in the air. The knocking continued for a while, following a pattern with brief pauses before resuming. It wasn't loud or aggressive, but it had a distinctly human quality to it, like someone gently tapping. We were both puzzled and a bit uneasy, trying to figure out how the sound could be coming from such an impossible location. In the end, we brushed it off as one of those unexplainable oddities and went to sleep. It's important to note that this has never happened again since that night. Incident number two. It was around 11 p.m. on a weeknight, just an ordinary evening with no strange occurrences leading up to it. At least none that I can recall. My partner and I were in the bedroom when our ring doorbell suddenly went off, chiming as if someone was walking past. Now, our driveway is quite long, and the ring is set to pick up motion only when someone is well up the pathway within a specific range. This made the alert unusual, as it's never happened before or since without a clear cause. Instantly on edge, I got out of bed and peered out the window. Living in a council estate in England, it's not uncommon to encounter some colorful characters late at night, but I saw nothing. No one was on the front garden path and everything seemed quiet. The front light, however, had been triggered, which wasn't too unusual given the wildlife that sometimes roams around. But as I turned to my partner to comment on the strange alert, we were both startled by a loud, forceful bang on our bedroom wall. The door was shut, and it sounded as if someone had slammed their fist against it, right in the middle of the frame. The door didn't open, but it shook with enough force that I could feel the impact. I was close enough to it that a wave of fear washed over me, while my partner, oddly enough, burst into nervous laughter. When I asked her what she found funny, she admitted she didn't know. It was just a gut reaction to the sudden shock. I opened the door expecting to find something, but the hallway was empty. My daughter, who was around three or four at the time, was asleep in her cot, and our cat was sitting calmly in the hallway, staring at me as if nothing out of the ordinary had happened. The timing of the doorbell ring alert just seconds before this loud bang left us both feeling incredibly uneasy. Although nothing else had happened that night, the tension lingered, making it hard to shake that feeling that something was just way too off. The ring doorbell did capture footage, but it showed nothing unusual. Just an empty path that something clearly set off the motion sensor. 
Adding to the creepiness was the specific alert on my phone. Instead of the usual, there's motion outside your front door notification, which typically triggers when something is at the edge of the detection range. This time it read, someone is at your front door. The specificity of that alert, given what followed, made the whole experience ten times scarier. Incident number three. The next incident I recall happened one evening while my partner was out for a driving lesson. It was around 5 p.m. The sky was still bright and the weather was pleasant. I was downstairs on my computer chatting with some friends on Discord when I decided to go upstairs to use the toilet. As I headed back down the stairs, I suddenly heard the sound of running water. I was about halfway down them when the noise registered, and I remember feeling a mix of confusion and alarm. My first thought was that something in the kitchen might be leaking. I reached the bottom of the stairs and glanced toward the kitchen, thinking maybe my partner had turned the washing machine on before she left for her driving lesson. The kitchen was still in its original place from the previous occupants, a bit outdated and prone to issues. There were damage to the walls and a missing ceiling due to the huge leak we had that caused us to replace it. The surfaces, cupboards, etc. were all original to the previous occupants. As I stepped into the hallway and looked directly into the kitchen, I saw something that made my stomach drop. Both tap handles were pushed fully forward. The kitchen was gushing out a full blast. My cat was sitting calmly on the kitchen floor, staring at me like nothing was out of the ordinary. I was completely freaking out, in a panic. I video called my mom on WhatsApp. I had already mentioned the previous incidents to my family, but they had mostly shrugged them off as nothing significant. But when my mom saw the taps open wide, she freaked out too. I think I needed someone to witness what was happening in real time to validate my own fear. Once again, my daughter was upstairs in her cot, fast asleep, and the baby monitor was with me downstairs. Everything seemed normal on that front, but the whole situation had me on edge. I felt trapped in the house, anxiously awaiting for my partner to return from her lesson. When she finally got back, I told her what had happened, and we tried to rationalize it. Maybe it was the water pressure, we thought. Maybe that somehow caused the taps to turn on by themselves, but it's worth noting that this had never happened before, and it hasn't happened since. Even my friends on Discord thought the whole thing was bizarre and stayed on the chat with me until my partner returned. Incident number four. A short while later, another unsettling event occurred. I'd gone to visit my nan, who lives about a 10-minute drive from our home. It was early evening, and we were sitting in her living room having a cup of tea when my partner called me, clearly distressed. She told me that she had been in the kitchen washing up when the baby monitor started acting up, flickering, distorting, and showing visual noise. Then she heard a massive bang on our front door, so loud and forceful that it immediately woke her daughter, who began crying in her cot. My partner said it sounded as if someone had thrown something heavy at the door, or run up to the driveway and slammed into it with great force. This really freaked her out, and I rushed home to check the CCTV. But when I reviewed the footage, there was nothing. No one outside. No movement captured. The ring doorbell hadn't been triggered either. We tried to stay rational, but given everything that has happened before, we were struggling not to let fear take over. My partner said the most unsettling part was how our daughter woke up crying the moment the bang occurred. She couldn't shake the uneasy feeling that came with it, like something was clearly wrong. Incident number five. By this point, the strange occurrences in our home had become sporadic, but frequent enough to keep us on edge. My partner began experiencing unsettling moments, like hearing knocking on the closed bathroom door. 
The knocks weren't aggressive or loud, but they were distinct enough to be unnerving. At night, we'd hear the bumps and bangs downstairs, and every suspicious sound seemed to amplify our growing paranoia. The atmosphere in the house had become thick with tension. We were both on edge, and it felt like the anxiety in our home was feeding on itself. We started arguing more frequently, which could have been due to a combination of pandemic stress. The fear from these strange events, or perhaps just the general pressure of everything happening around us. Whatever the cause, it was clear that these incidents were taking a toll on our relationship and our sense of peace. While there wasn't a single standout event during this time, it's important to note that these little things were happening consistently. Interestingly, the knocking on doors seemed to be something my partner experienced more than I did, especially when she was all alone in the bathroom. I never heard the knocking myself when I was alone, but I did notice strange behavior with our baby monitor during the nights, particularly when my partner was working night shifts at the local city hospital. The baby monitor would often have interference or visual glitches that made it nearly unusable. Sometimes it would become so distorted that I'd turn it off for a few minutes, hoping to reset it. But that rarely solved the problem. These disturbances, though, small on their own, added up to a growing sense of unease that we could not shake. Incident number six. It was around 3 a.m. and I was wide awake, watching Netflix in bed. I glanced over at the baby monitor on our bedside table to check on my daughter, and that's when I saw it. A white mist moving across the screen. At first, I couldn't believe what I was seeing, so I kept watching. My jaw dropped when I saw the unmistakable silhouette of someone moving through my daughter's bedroom. The figure walked up to the side of her cot, looked in, then walked away, only to repeat the same motion over and over. This wasn't just a shadow or a trick of the light. It was a clear human-shaped silhouette with distant arms and legs moving as if it were a person pacing around the room. I couldn't make out any features to determine if it was a man or a woman, but the way it moved was eerily natural, as if it were a living person checking in on my daughter. Her bedroom backs onto our garden, surrounded by other gardens on all sides. There's no road where a passing car could cast headlights into the room. So, there was no rational explanation for what I was seeing. The layout of our home and the surrounding area made it impossible for this to be a reflection or an outside window. Terrified, I shook my partner awake. She was understandably annoyed at being waken up in the middle of the night, but I was so scared I couldn't even speak. I was afraid that if I said something aloud, we might somehow attract the attention of whatever was in the room with our daughter. Instead, I grabbed my phone and frantically typed out what I was seeing. I typed out and told her we needed to get our daughter leave the house, and go to my mom's immediately. She refused, demanding to know what was going on. I handed her the phone, still too shaken up to say a word, and pointed at the baby monitor. We both watched in stunned silence as the silhouette continued its routine, walking up to the cot, stopping, then walking away, only to repeat the process. This went on for what felt like an eternity, though it was probably just a couple of minutes. What happened next still amazes me. Here I was, the supposed man of the house, too frightened to even speak, while my partner suddenly jumped out of the bed and ran straight into our daughter's bedroom. I grabbed an aluminum baseball bat from beside the bed and followed her, though in hindsight I had no idea what I thought I'd accomplish with a damn baseball bat. My partner burst into our daughter's room, fearless, and we were both shocked to find everything perfectly normal. Our daughter was fast asleep. The room was still, and there was no sign of anything unusual. 
We checked the room thoroughly. Nothing seemed out of place, and there was no bad or menacing energy. We both returned to our bedroom, where we checked the baby monitor again. The silhouette was still there, but it was fading, growing more and more translucent until it eventually disappeared. I had no idea how we managed to fall asleep that night. I was desperate to leave and go to my mom's house, but my partner insisted that we stay. It was our home, after all. It's worth noting that this had never happened before, and it hasn't happened since. But the memory of that night still haunts me. So let's bring it to a conclusion. At this point, I was at my breaking point, desperate for answers. I reached out to the vicar from our local church. He listened to my account and explained that what I was describing sounded like a poltergeist, a type of spirit known for causing disturbances. He also asked if I was involved in witchcraft, black magic, or in occult practices. I assured him that I wasn't involved in anything of the sort. The vicar suggested that the disturbances might be connected to my daughter. At the time, she was around four years old. He theorized that she might have been experiencing or feeling emotions she couldn't yet understand or articulate, which could manifest as poltergeist activity. He explained that a poltergeist is typically a trickster, feeding off the energy it provokes and not necessarily a malevolent spirit. Instead, it's often a manifestation of emotional energy, particularly from children undergoing significant changes or stress. I also mentioned that the previous occupant of the house, an elderly lady, had passed away there. I was told this information by a neighbor. The vicar suggested that her spirit might still be present and could benefit from assistance in moving on. He offered to visit our home to perform prayers and blessings to help any lingering spirits. He also provided me with some prayers to say in my daughter's room each night. I agreed to contact him again if anything else occurred and thanked him for his guidance. It's worth noting that my partner was hesitant about these measures, concerned that they might make things worse. And so, this is where the story ends. Since contacting the vicar, the activity in our home ceased abruptly. We've had a few odd occurrences since then, but nothing comparable to the level of activity we experienced before. Reflecting on it now, I can say that if any of these incidents had occurred in isolation, I might have dismissed them as more coincidences. However, the sequence and intensity of the events make it difficult to ignore the possibility of something meaningful linking them together. The baby monitor incident remains a particularly eerie piece of evidence. Despite our efforts to rationalize the experience, that one event continues to stand out as a profound mystery. The fact that both my partner and I witnessed it together, at the very least, is evidence enough for us that we did experience something that night. Here's a bit of a background. Back in November 2022, my family moved into a new flat after complications with our landlord with our old house. That house was without a doubt haunted. I saw figures, heard noises, nightly from the attic, and was the reason I started believing in the paranormal. So, I was a little disappointed that I wasn't getting anything in our new place. Fast forward to this last month, where stuff has been getting more active. While not to the extent of where I lived prior, I have been seeing more figures out of the corner of my eye and have been hearing much noises such as knocks and taps around the house especially when I'm the only one awake. Hell, the reason I'm writing about this is because I saw a figure that looked identical to my brother walking into my mother's room while both were in the living room. 
I was just speaking to them as I was walking back to the bedroom. I see him. But that's not the part that confused me over the last couple of weeks. About a week ago now, at around 4 a.m. on another sleepless night, I heard what can only be explained as a scratch on my desk followed by something falling off it. I don't think it was paranormal, so decided I'd joke around with it and called out to it, asking if anything was there, and if it was to please make a noise, to which it responded by knocking on my desk. I talked to it for like 30 minutes, clear knocks almost immediately after I asked a question, but only after some, only really responding to me when I wanted to confirm it was still there. Eventually, I started to think I was just hearing random noises, if not a bit coincidental, until it responded with the loudest set of knocks I had ever heard from something non-human. I had some on my door in my old house that could be confused for another person if it weren't for the fact everyone was asleep. It genuinely sounded like someone was in my room hitting my desk. As I said, it's been a week now, and I have heard no knocks apart from one that night. I have spent countless hours since then listening and have gotten nothing. Why has activity started again after so long in such a new flat, which was built in 2007, after nearly two years of nothing? Sorry if this is sounding crazy. I, I don't normally write my stories this way. And I'm usually in a strong state of mind, but right now I'm in a state of Strong confusion over this. This took place back in 2019 when I was 11. My grandparents live in a large Victorian-styled home on the outskirts of Portland, Oregon. The building was made in the late 1800s, so it has that classic old building look to it. Me and my family go down there occasionally from our home up near Bellingham, Washington. And in early September of that year, my family decided that they wanted to pay my grandparents a visit. I was excited to see my grandparents, but not so much to go to the house. Up until that point, nothing out of the ordinary had happened in that house. The only thing it did was creep me out especially if I was alone. The first day we were there, nothing out of the ordinary happened. My grandparents and I did our annual game of Clue, a murder mystery board game for those that don't know. We enjoyed dinner, and that was basically it. But little did I know, when I went to sleep that night, that tomorrow would be anything but ordinary. When I woke up the next day, I was excited because I was a die-hard Seahawks fan, and today was going to be their first game of the season. Outside, it was warm and muggy, so in my room, which was one of the two rooms on the third floor, I had the window open with a fan on to let out the hot air. Later that day, my dad came up to my room and said that he and everyone else was going to go on a walk. I acknowledged him by nodding, glued to the Seahawks game that was on my tablet screen. He then left and shut the door behind him. What happens next still terrifies me to this day. About 10 minutes later, I heard what I thought to be my mom yelling from downstairs. Somewhat annoyed, I stood up and turned the fan off next to the window to listen if my mom was actually calling me or if my mind was playing tricks on me. Then I heard it again. My mom was definitely calling my name. I opened the door frustrated. I was missing part of the game and yelled in an annoyed tone. Yeah. When there was no response, I yelled down from the third floor stairs again. Uh, yeah. Then my mom called back and said something like, I want to show you this, or something like that. I couldn't really make out what she was saying. 
Annoyed but not wanting to ignore my mom, I hurried down the stairs onto the second floor. Where are you? I said, genuinely not knowing where she was. Here, she said. It sounded like it was coming from the first floor, but something was off. Her voice sounded very muffled and weird. I played it off as me just being paranoid, I guess. So I walked down to the first floor, now getting a little scared. Uh, Mom? I said. No reply. I searched almost every single room, and no one was there. That left only one room. The basement. There was no way in hell I was going down there, though. So I started heading back towards the stairs, when all of a sudden... Basement door swung open. I yelled, spinning around. No one was there. Then I heard footsteps walking down the basement stairs. Someone was definitely there. And then I heard my mom say again, Here, in that same weird muffled voice. I got chills down my spine. Something definitely was not right. I turned and ran as fast as I could up the stairs and onto the second floor. I ran across the kitchen to the narrow staircase that led up to the third floor. Then I stopped dead in my tracks, paralyzed with fear. At the top of the staircase was a shadow-like person without a face saying in my mother's voice, Here. I screamed at the top of my lungs and practically threw myself down the stairs and out of the front door. I then waited outside near the trees, glancing over my shoulders every two seconds, before my family finally came back from their walk. When I told them what had happened, they didn't believe me at first. But seeing as I was crying and looking genuinely freaked out, they told me that they believed me. I don't know if they were telling the truth or if they just wanted me to feel comforted. But either way, there was no way I was sleeping in that building. After about 10 minutes of reasoning with them, I decided I would be more comfortable if I slept in my parents' room that night. This incident still haunts me to this day. I rarely ever sleep in a room alone in that house anymore. This story happened to me about 20 years ago when I was still a sophomore in high school. My aunt and uncle had a three-story condo that was always kind of off. It wasn't a particularly old or creepy looking building in my recollection, but as soon as you set foot inside, there was just something in the air that reeked of something isn't right. For a little background, the condo's first floor held the living and dining areas, the kitchen, and the back door that leads to a small patio. The second story was the master bedroom, two guest bedrooms, a bathroom, and a little nook for the washer and dryer. The third floor was a game room with several old video game consoles like an Atari, a Jaguar, and Sega Genesis, with my uncle's Star Trek collection in one corner, and a door that leads to the attic crawl space. It also had a pull-out sofa sleeper for guests. This layout information will be important later. As I grew up, we visited the condo many times. Like I said, the entire building had an odd aura about it, but this all culminated on the third floor. When you walked over the final stair up to the third floor, the air just changed. Where on the second floor, you could hear the sounds of family visiting downstairs and hear traffic outside, etc. On the third floor, it was always completely silent. The air was heavy and thick. No sounds permeated here, and you were always left with a feeling of being stared at or watched. Almost as if you were intruding there. Being kids, my cousin and I would often go up there to the third floor to play video games. However, 
We never went up there alone, and absolutely never went up there at night. It was just one of those places that felt like it was on a different plane of existence, its own pocket dimension of silence and gloom. My family had seen and heard the things in that condo on multiple occasions. It was common knowledge that one could hear footsteps pacing up and down the stairs at night. You would see figures out of the corner of your eye. Doors would open and close despite being locked. Objects would move. That sort of thing. One morning, I woke up before the adults to find a trail of pennies laying end to end from the third floor all the way down to the kitchen. I remember being a little unsettled by this, but not particularly afraid. I was more interested in free money and greedily put the pennies in a Ziploc bag to take home with me. Because those things were relatively benign in nature, my family assumed it to be the spirit of my late grandfather, who was the mischievous sort in life, watching over the house at night. Fast forward to my teenage years. My uncle passed away suddenly one year, and so a flood of tight-knit family descended on the condo to comfort my aunt and attend my uncle's funeral. Because there were so many people staying in the condo, my mom, dad, sister, and I were regulated to sleeping upstairs on the third floor. I was creeped out, but I figured, hey, how bad could it be? Boy, was I in for a surprise. The day of the funeral came, and we all attended the wake, after which the family gathered outside to comfort my aunt, who was sobbing uncontrollably at the loss of her husband. I remember the sound being a gut-wrenching, heartbreaking cry of pure despair. I actually hurt to listen to it, so I quickly retreated from the crowd of onlookers and went to find my cousins until we were ready to leave. Little did I know that all hell was about to break loose. We got back to the condo and everyone wept and shared stories of my uncle. After some time, we all grew tired and decided it was time for bed. I slept on the sofa while my mom and dad and little sister all shared an air mattress down on the floor by the foot of the sofa. What I remember most about that night was the cold. I startled awake in the middle of the night, unsure of what I had woken up to, only to be greeted by the same bone-biting, skin-saturating cold I had never felt in my life. It permeated the entire third floor, soaking through my clothes and into my body. I shuddered and pulled the blankets tighter around me, I remember being puzzled by the cold, as the third floor usually got uncomfortably warm. I lay there shivering for a few minutes, and then I heard it. The sound I heard is hard to describe, but is possibly best described as something trying its best to mimic my aunt's sobbing from earlier. It was a dry, raspy voice crying and choking and carrying on in a mocking tone, and it was extremely loud. I mean, ear-splittingly loud. It was coming from the far corner of the room, over by the crawlspace door. I froze in terror. What in the hell was going on? Was this some kind of an entity? I peeked over the edge of the blanket and gazed into the darkness at the corner of the room. Nothing, of course, was there. My mother, having had past experiences with paranormal things, had once told me that if anything scary ever happened like that, to ignore it and it would go away. So that's exactly what I tried to do. I squinted my eyes shut and pretended to be asleep. When that didn't work, I tried covering my head with a couch cushion to blot out the sound of this thing. That didn't work either. The sound stayed as loud as it had been, almost as if it were coming from inside my own head. 
I lay like that for what seemed like minutes, but was probably only about 45 seconds or so. When another noise grabbed my attention, the rustling of blankets, I peered out from under my own blanket to see my mother had bolted up on the air mattress. She looked left and looked right with a confused expression on her face, and then jumped up and ran down the stairs to the second floor. My father and sister were still sound asleep. The next thing is what my mom told me happened after she ran down the stairs. Mom got to the second floor and immediately opened the master bedroom, thinking my aunt was awake and crying. Nope, sound asleep. Mom could still hear the wailing, so she checked all the other rooms on the second floor. Everyone was asleep. Confused, she stood at the bottom of the stairs, leading to the third floor, and listened to the wailing. Meanwhile, my fear had given way to curiosity. Glancing cautiously over toward the corner where the sound was coming from, I leaned over the banister and gazed down to the second floor. I could see the hall light on downstairs, and Mom looking bewildered at the bottom of the steps. Mom, I called. She nearly jumped out of her skin. Her head snapped up to look at me. Are you looking for that wailing sound? Mom's eyes widened. You hear it too? I nodded at this. Why isn't anyone else waking up? She called. I shrugged. She then turned away from me and headed towards the stairs leading to the first floor. As she rounded the corner toward the first floor, she ran headlong into my little cousin. He was wide-eyed in tears and shaking. Mom asked him what was wrong with him, and he said, It's coming to get me. Mom began to ask him what was coming to get him. When she saw it, a shadow, humanoid, came lurching up the steps towards them, blacker than the darkness that surrounded it. As it approached, it began to morph, to grow into something monstrous. Now standing seven or eight feet tall, it began lunging up the stairs at them, making a horrible sound as it came. Mom grabbed my cousin and began sprinting up the stairs, the shadow stomping just behind her. This cacophony caught my attention, and now, completely ignoring the wailing in the room with me, I craned my neck over the banister to see what was going on. I saw Mom sliding around the corner towards the third floor stairs, a flood of shade and darkness filling halfway behind her. My little cousin was screaming and clutching at my Mom's neck as she ran, taking the stairs two at a time. Mom, I cried. Mom, it's right behind you, run. She obliged and came flying up the final steps to the third floor. As soon as she cleared the landing, the wailing completely stopped, cut off like someone pulled the plug on a speaker. She leaped into the air mattress with my cousin. I abandoned all pretenses of maturity and clambered onto the mattress with them. We all sat there, huddled in abject terror staring into the darkness of the staircase. Nothing came. No shadow. No wailing. Nothing. That's when the stomping started. Boom, boom, boom. Up and down the stairs it went, over and over, rattling the knickknacks on the walls, vibrating the floors. Still, nobody woke up. After several minutes of this, the footsteps reached the third floor and stopped dead. The temperature in the room immediately started to plummet, and Mom clearly had enough. She started violently shaking my father awake. Wake up, she snarled. Wake up! When Dad woke up, everything got quiet again. He was groggy and annoyed and asked us what we were doing. We explained what had happened, my cousin still crying in my mother's arms, and he looked at us skeptically. 
but listened intently with us for any sounds in the house. Sounds never came for the rest of the night, but none of us really slept through that. In the morning, my cousin, still visibly shaken, explained to us what had happened to him before Mom found him. He said he heard a voice calling for him downstairs and thought his father, my late uncle, had returned. He was young, and I don't think he understood the permanence of death. When he went down to investigate, he said he ran into the shadow and that it was too big to be my daddy. I don't know what exactly happened that night. I've read about shadow people, about Jen, about demons, but nothing quite matches the being we saw that night. If anyone has a good answer or has run into an entity like this, please feel free to let me know. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true haunted house stories. Before I go any further, I would like to give a very special shout out to the elite members of Back to Ashes. Patty's niece, Chrissy Elias, Anita V, Donna, Les Crispin, Samantha Place, Call Carter, Corpse Lover, Stephanie McLaren, Denise S, Tina Mead, Tammy Slayton, Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Amy Klimko, and Haunted. Again, I can't express my gratitude enough for you all that choose to remain the pillar of which this channel stands upon. My deepest gratitude, always, 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 to the subscribers, to the new listeners, and for the peekaboos that popped in to see what the channel is about. Thank you for your support. For without you, I would not have a voice and there would not be a back to ashes. Thank you all so much for your support. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good night. Peace, love, and light to you all.